Today's episode is made possible by our generous supporters, Aaron, Marissa, Etiosa, and John. Thank you guys so much for making this episode possible. All right, guys, we are starting a brand new audiobook here today, The Hound of the Baskervilles. And yes, that is Baskervilles, plural, which I always thought I was just mispronouncing it or something, but it's actually Baskervilles with an S. So learn something new every day. Anyway, um, yeah, this is back by popular demand. Um, I don't want anyone to think that this is the Sherlock Holmes podcast. We do all different types of audiobooks. So if you go back and listen to the um, old episodes, I think we've, we're pushing 10 or 12 different audiobooks that we've done, all kinds of different genres and even some indie author stuff. So this is not just the Sherlock Holmes podcast, but it does seem to be a favorite with all the listeners. So everybody wanted to hear another Sherlock Holmes story. So I, um, <laughs> I'm delivering another Sherlock home story for you so i hope you guys enjoy this this is just carrying on i think this is the fifth sherlock holmes book that we've done um which i'm totally fine with i love sherlock holmes doing the voice is a ton of fun so if you guys are enjoying it i'm enjoying it and that's all that matters so yeah now without further ado i give you chapter one of the hound of the baskervilles the hound of the baskervilles another adventure of sherlock holmes written by a conan doyle Narrated by Brady Smith My dear Robinson, it was your account of a West Country legend that this tale owes its inception. For this, and for your help in the details, all thanks. Yours most truly, A. Conan Doyle Hindhead Halsmere Chapter 1 Mr. Sherlock Holmes Mr. Sherlock Holmes, who was usually very late in the mornings, save upon those not infrequent occasions when he was up all night, was seated at the breakfast table. I stood upon the hearth rug and picked up the stick which our visitor had left behind him the night before. It was a fine, thick piece of wood, bulbous-headed, of the sort which is known as a Penang lawyer. Just under the head was a broad silver band, nearly an inch across. To James Mortimer, MRCS, from his friends of the CCH, was engraved upon it, with the date 1884. It was just such a stick as the old-fashioned family practitioner used to carry, dignified, solid, and reassuring. Well, Watson, what do you make of it? Holmes was sitting with his back to me, and I had given him no sign in my occupation. How did you know what I was doing? I believe you have eyes in the back of your head. "'I have at least a well-polished, silver-plated coffee-pot in front of me,' said he. "'But tell me, Watson, what do you make of our visitor's stick? "'Since we have been so unfortunate as to miss him, and have no notion of his errand, "'this accidental souvenir becomes of importance. "'Let me hear you reconstruct the man by an examination of it.' "'I think,' said I, following as far as I could the methods of my companion— then Dr. Mortimer is a successful elderly medical man, well esteemed since those who know him gave him this mark of their appreciation. Good, said Holmes. Excellent. I think also that the probability is in favour of his being a country practitioner who does a great deal of his visiting on foot. Why so? "'Because this stick, though originally a very handsome one, has been so knocked about that I can hardly imagine a town practitioner carrying it. The thick iron furel is worn down, so it is evident that he has done a great amount of walking with it.' "'Perfectly sound,' said Holmes. "'And, then again, there is the Friends of the C.C.H. I should guess that to be the something hunt, the local hunt, to whose members he has possibly given some surgical assistance, and which has made him a small presentation in return. "'Really, Watson, you excel yourself,' said Holmes, pushing his chair back and lighting a cigarette. "'I am bound to say that in all the accounts which you have been so good as to give of my own small achievements, you have habitually underrated your own abilities.' It may be that you are not yourself luminous, but you are a conductor of light. Some people, without possessing genius, have a remarkable power of stimulating it. I confess, my dear fellow, that I am very much in your debt. He had never said as much before, and I must admit that his words gave me keen pleasure, for I had often been piqued by his indifference to my admiration and to the attempts which I had made to give publicity to his methods. I was proud, too, to think that I had so far mastered his system as to apply it in a way which earned his approval. 
He now took the stick from my hands and examined it for a few minutes with his naked eyes. Then, with an expression of interest, he laid down his cigarette, and, carrying the cane to the window, he looked over it again with a convex lens. "'Interesting, though elementary,' said he as he returned to his favourite corner of the settee. "'There are certainly one or two indications upon the stick. It gives us the basis for several deductions.' "'Has anything escaped me?' I asked with some self-importance. "'I trust that there is nothing of consequence which I have overlooked.' "'I am afraid, my dear Watson, that most of your conclusions were erroneous. "'When I said that you stimulated me, I meant, to be frank, "'that in noting your fallacies I was occasionally guided towards the truth. "'Not that you are entirely wrong in this instance. "'The man is certainly a country practitioner, and he walks a good deal.' "'Then I was right. "'To that extent. "'But that was all.' "'No, no, my dear Watson, not all. "'By no means all. I would suggest, for example, that a presentation to a doctor is more likely to come from a hospital than from a hunt, and that when the initials CC are placed before that hospital, the words Charing Cross very naturally suggest themselves. You may be right. The probability lies in that direction, and if we take this as a working hypothesis, we have a fresh basis from which to start our construction of this unknown visitor. "'Well, then, supposing the CCH does stand for Charing Cross Hospital, what further inferences may we draw?' "'Do none suggest themselves. You know my methods, apply them. I can only think of the obvious conclusion that the man has practised in town before going to the country.' "'I think that we might venture a little farther than this. Look at it in this light. On what occasion would it be most probable that such a presentation would be made?' When would his friends unite to give him a pledge of their good will? Obviously, at the moment when Dr. Mortimer withdrew from the service of the hospital in order to start a practice for himself. We know there has been a presentation. We believe there has been a change from a town hospital to a country practice. Is it then stretching our inference too far to say that the presentation was on the occasion of the change? It certainly seems probable. Now... You will observe that he could not have been on the staff of the hospital, since only a man well established in a London practice could hold such a position, and such a one would not drift into the country. What was he, then? If he was in the hospital and yet not on the staff, he could only have been a house surgeon or a house physician, little more than a senior student, and he left five years ago. The date is on the stick. So your grave, middle-aged family practitioner vanishes into thin air, my dear Watson, and there emerges a young fellow, under thirty, amiable, unambitious, absent-minded, and the possessor of a favourite dog, which I should describe roughly as being larger than a terrier and smaller than a mastiff. I laughed incredulously as Sherlock Holmes leaned back in his settee and blew little wavering rings of smoke up to the ceiling. As to the latter part, I have no means of checking you said I. But at least it is not difficult to find out a few particulars about the man's age and professional career. From my small medical shelf, I took down the medical directory and turned up the name. There were several Mortimers, but only one who could be our visitor. I read his record aloud. Mortimer James, MRCS, 1882, Grimpen, Dartmoor, Devon, House Surgeon from 1882 to 1884, at Charing Cross Hospital, Winner of the Jackson Prize for Comparative Pathology, an essay entitled Is Disease a Reversion? Corresponding member of the Swedish Pathological Society, author of Some Freaks of Atavism, Lancet, 1882, Dewey Progress, Journal of Psychology, March, 1883, Medical Officer for the Parishes of Grimpen, Thorsley, and Highbarrow. No mention of that local hunt, Watson, said Holmes with a mischievous smile. But a country doctor, as you very astutely observed, I think that I am fairly justified in my inferences. As to the adjectives, I said, if I remember right, amiable, unambitious, and absent-minded. It is my experience that it is only an amiable man in this world who receives testimonials, only an unambitious one who abandons a London career for the country, and only an absent-minded one who leaves his stick and not his visiting card after waiting an hour in your room." And the dog has been in the habit of carrying the stick behind his master. Being a heavy stick, the dog has held it tight by the middle, and the marks of his teeth are very plainly visible. 
The dog's jaw, as shown in the space between these marks, is too broad in my opinion for a terrier, and not broad enough for a mastiff. It may have been, yes, by Jove, it is a curly-haired spaniel. He had risen and paced the room as he spoke. Now he halted in the recess of the window. There was such a ring of conviction in his voice that I glanced up in surprise. My dear fellow, how can you possibly be so sure of that? For the very simple reason that I see the dog himself on our very doorstep, and there is the ring of its owner. Don't move, I beg you, Watson. He is a professional brother of yours, and your presence may be of assistance to me. Now is the dramatic moment of fate, Watson, when you hear a step upon the stair which is walking into your life, and you know not whether for good or ill. What does Dr. James Mortimer, the man of science, ask of Sherlock Holmes, the specialist in crime? Come in. The appearance of our visitor was a surprise to me, since I had expected a typical country practitioner. He was a very tall, thin man, with a long nose like a beak, which jutted out between two keen grey eyes, set closely together and sparkling brightly from behind a pair of gold-rimmed glasses. He was clad in a professional but rather slovenly fashion, for his frock coat was dingy and his trousers frayed. Though young, his long back was already bowed, and he walked with a forward thrust of his head and a general air of peering benevolence. As he entered, his eyes fell upon the stick in Holmes's hand, and he ran towards it with an exclamation of joy. Oh, "'I am so very glad,' said he. "'I was not sure whether I had left it here or in the shipping office. I would not lose that stick for the world.' "'A presentation, I see,' said Holmes. "'Yes, sir.' "'From Charing Cross Hospital?' "'From one or two friends there on the occasion of my marriage.' "'Dear, dear, that's bad,' said Holmes, shaking his head. Dr. Mortimer blinked through his glasses in mild astonishment. "'Why was it bad?' "'Only that you have disarranged our little deductions. Your marriage, you say?' "'Yes, sir. I married and so left the hospital, and with it all hopes of a consulting practice, it was necessary to make a home of my own.' "'Come, come. We are not so far wrong after all,' said Holmes. "'And now, Dr. James Mortimer—' "'Mister, sir, mister. A humble M.R.C.S.' "'And a man of precise mind, evidently.' "'A dabbler in science, Mr. Holmes. A picker-up of shells on the shore of the great unknown ocean.' I presume that it is Mr. Sherlock Holmes who I am addressing, and not— No, this is my friend, Dr. Watson. Glad to meet you, sir. I have heard your name mentioned in connection with that of your friend. You interest me very much, Mr. Holmes. I had hardly expected so dalicocephalic a skull, or such well-marked supraorbital development. Would you have any objection to my running my fingers along your parietal fissure? A cast of your skull, sir, until the original is available, would be an ornament to any anthropological museum. It is not my intention to be so fulsome, but I confess that I covet your skull. Sherlock Holmes waved our strange visitor into a chair. You are an enthusiast in your line of thought, I perceive, sir, as I am in mine, said he. I observe from your forefinger that you make your own cigarettes. Have no hesitation in lighting one. The man drew out paper and tobacco and twirled the one up in the other with surprising dexterity. He had long, quivering fingers, as agile and restless as the antenna of an insect. Holmes was silent, but his little darting glances showed me the interest which he took in our curious companion. "'I presume, sir,' said he at last, "'that it was not merely for the purpose of examining my skull that you have done me the honour to call here last night and again to-day?' "'No, sir, no, though I am happy to have had the opportunity of doing that as well. I came to you, Mr. Holmes, because I recognise that I am myself an unpractical man, and because I am suddenly confronted with the most serious and extraordinary problem, recognising as I do that you are the second highest expert in Europe.' "'Indeed, sir. May I inquire who has the honour to be the first? asked Holmes with some asperity. To the man of precisely scientific mind, the work of Monsieur Bertillon must always appeal strongly. Then had you not better consult him? I said, sir, to the precisely scientific mind, but as a practical man of affairs, it is acknowledged that you stand alone. I trust, sir, that I have not inadvertently— Just a little, said Holmes. 
I think, Dr. Mortimer, you would do wisely if, without more ado, you would kindly tell me plainly what the exact nature of the problem is in which you demand my assistance. Alrighty, thank you guys so much for tuning in and listening today. It is just such an honor to me to have so many loyal listeners who just keep tuning in episode after episode. Um, this is, I don't know, I feel like we're, we're really starting to build a little bit of a family and I really enjoy that. Thank you so much again to our supporters um, who have actually pledged a uh, monthly contribution to the podcast. We have Marissa, Aaron, Etiosa and John. So thank you guys so much for being supporters of the podcast. You made this episode possible. And uh, as you know, a listener to this podcast who's not a supporter yet, and I say yes, um, I just want to know. I want you to know that uh, this episode was made possible by the general generous donations of Marissa, Etiosa, Aaron, and John. So you can thank them for this. Uh, moving on to this new Sherlock Holmes uh, adventure. So thank you guys so much for listening, and remember to share the podcast. That is. Um, the best way I know um, is tough times right now for a lot of people and so I don't want you to feel like oh I have to you know start contributing to the podcast or anything like that um, it, it means so much to me when you do but if you can't uh, the, it's totally free for you to just tell somebody about the podcast I love telling other people about new podcasts that I found and that I enjoy so if you are enjoying this go ahead and tell somebody who knows you might uh, be introducing them to their new favorite podcast all right thanks so much for listening guys we will catch you next time When I was in school, I absolutely hated writing. It wasn't until I was a bit older that I came to understand the power of words. If you're a business owner, you understand that power too. A business blog, when done right, can drive sales, increase revenue, and get you more customers. But as a business owner, you probably don't have the time to do all that writing. Plus, if you're not a copywriter by trade, you might feel like you're just kind of throwing words out there and they're not actually accomplishing anything. The good news is, there's a simple solution. Check it out. I call it the ultimate blog post checklist for businesses with online stores. This checklist will allow you to write better, more effective articles that convert readers into buyers. It's full of easy-to-follow examples to get your creativity flowing based on experience of nearly a million words written. And best of all, it's effective on any type of article in any industry or niche. I've successfully used this exact checklist on topics from pool table reviews to investment advice. Tired of spending tons of time writing stuff that doesn't convert? This checklist will change that by giving you highly effective blog posts and articles that transform readers into paying customers. Go to Invicta.Enterprises slash free checklist and start saving time and transforming your writing now. That's Invicta.Enterprises slash free checklist.